The Where Our Minds Wanda podcast may contain sensitive content. Listener discretion is advised. Greetings, fellow wanderers, to the places our minds wander. The house at the end of the dirt road, where disembodied voices whisper and strange sounds make the living shiver. Where shadows lurk at the edge of the woods, just outside your back door. And mysterious lights speed beyond reason across the clear night sky. Odd events throughout time that lead you down the rabbit hole. I'm Wes. And I'm Beth. And this is Where Our Minds Wander. Hello and welcome to Where Our Minds Wander, all you fellow wanderers. Thank you for joining us. Yes, hello everybody. I can't believe a whole week has gone by already. And here I am sitting across from you once again. Seems like it was just yesterday. Well, you were sitting across from me last night. Well, yeah, but not here in the studio. (laughs) No, not here in the studio. Well, maybe while we were doing our research. Right, that's true. We do it from time to time. Earlier today, we were... And I'm editing and you're you're researching your story. Yeah, we were sitting across from each other earlier today. Yeah, we were. You know, I think the older I get, the faster the days go by and I accomplish half of what I used to accomplish. That's what it feels like. Really? Yeah. No, not for me. You got a lot done today. (laughs) As I get older, I'm doing even more because I'm trying to get so much done in a short period of time. Right. Because we've got a lot going on, really. We do. We do. I mean, I've got to get my story ready. You've got to get your story ready. I have to edit after. There's a lot going on. Plus, there has to be us time. I was going to say, plus our regular lives. Yeah. Not just podcast life, but regular life. And we usually record on Sunday night, which we are right now, and uh, we're just coming off a hell of a weekend. We had a blast this weekend, didn't we? We we did have a good weekend. (laughs) I think it's one of the best weekends that we've had in a long time. (laughs) It was fun, for sure. Yeah, we had a buddy over, had some drinks, told all kinds of stories. Listened to some good music. Yeah. Yeah, it was a good time. Yeah, it was some quality downtime, that's for sure. And for those of you that are new listeners to our podcast, thank you for joining us. We hope you stay with us. And uh, each week, Beth and I share stories that piqued our curiosity from cryptids to supernatural to paranormal. To aliens. Yeah, pretty much anything that really... Weird places, morbid history, anything that strikes us as just out of the... Ordinary. Ordinary. Yeah. Well. With all that said, we're not doing any housekeeping this week. Nah. The hell with it. <laughs> we did, You did enough of actual housekeeping today. We don't need to do any verbal housekeeping. Yeah, I've got to hire a maid. Right. We've had this discussion. They don't seem to really have any maids around here. Not the kind of maid that you want, <laughs> who brings you drinks and <laughs> cooks your meals and does the housekeeping and stands in the corner and waits for you to snap your fingers. No, they don't have that kind of maid <laughs> service. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's what you think I want in a maid. I'm pretty sure that's what you expressed you want in a maid. <laughs> All right. (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) Why don't you tell us where your mind wandered for this episode? All righty. It's definitely um, a little darker than the mood we just set. So we'll have to have to get into the mood for a darker tale. The drowned man was pulled from the Seine in 1890. With his full mustache, he looked very much like Louis Le Prince, the man who had been missing for weeks. Police took a photograph, which was pretty ironic considering who Louis Le Prince was, and the body was taken to the morgue, where no one claimed it. Who was Louis Le Prince? Just a cutting-edge inventor whose widow believed had been kidnapped by order of rival Thomas Edison. Oh, I'm not a fan of Edison at all. (sighs) Well, then you're going to really like this story. 
because that is a huge accusation. But it was one that Lizzie Whitley stuck to for the rest of her life. You see, there's another way I could have started this story. In a garden in Leeds, England, on October 14, 1888. Louis Le Prince carried out a large mahogany box and placed it down in his father-in-law's garden on four spindly legs. As Le Prince turned the metal crank on the box's side, he asked his friends and family to walk around it. As they circled the camera, which was running at 12 frames per second, the very first motion picture of all time was made. According to Harpers.com, this very first piece of film shows four figures. Le Prince's father-in-law Joseph and mother-in-law Sarah, his 16-year-old son Adolf, and a family friend, Annie Hartley, and they're just walking. Being young, Adolf walks much quicker than his grandparents. Joseph flaps his raincoat for added effect, and Annie turns away from the mahogany box as though she is just realizing that she has been caught on film. The film was even more poignant because Sarah, Le Prince's mother-in-law, died just 10 days after her film debut. And if you want to look at it online, you can find it. And it's really fascinating. It's only about three or four seconds long. But it's just this family having this great time, just kind of like traipsing around outside. And they all do kind of ham it up a little bit. It's, it's actually really, really, it's sweet. Shortly after his first successful motion picture, Le Prince was able to do it again, filming Adolf goofing around on an accordion and the pedestrian and road traffic crossing the Leeds Bridge. Just two years later, after filing and receiving patents from both the United States and Britain, Le Prince was planning to share his invention with the world. And then he mysteriously disappeared. Only Thomas Edison and the Lumiere brothers were left to duke it out over who would reveal their motion picture first, since no one had ever heard of Louis Le Prince. Well, that's not exactly true. Louis Le Prince was worth hearing about and had made a name for himself in his own right. It's just that no one really equated his name with motion pictures until years after his disappearance. Louis Augustin Le Prince, known as Augustin or Gus to his friends, was born in Metz, France in 1841. His father had been an artillery captain in Napoleon's army, and one of his father's friends just happened to be Louis Daguerre, the inventor of daguerreotypes. Le Prince studied photography and chemistry in Daguerre's studio, and the young man was fascinated by new technology. Although he studied painting at first, Le Prince went on to study chemistry in Paris and at Leipzig University, but photography was always his main love. At the age of 25, Le Prince was invited to move to Leeds, England, by one of his university friends, Jack Whitley. Whitley was the son of a wealthy manufacturer, and within three years, Le Prince had married Jack's sister, Lizzie. Now, Lizzie was an accomplished artist in her own right, and the two of them opened an art school, the Leeds Technical School of Art. They became very well known for coloring photographs and using them as collages on pottery and metal pieces. But Le Prince hadn't focused on photography just yet. He was a successful employee for Whitley Partners, at least for now. Again, according to Harpers.org, Le Prince was messing around with some photographs one day when he accidentally let the glass plate slip in his hands, and he was mesmerized by the way the blurred subjects in the photographs seemed to be moving. He began to ask himself if moving figures could be captured on film. When Whitley Partners chose him to sell Lynn Crusta, 
a cheaply made wallpaper in New York City, Le Prince, Lizzie, and their six children moved to the U.S. In the meantime, Whitley Partners went bankrupt, and Le Prince found himself in debt to the tune of 350 pounds. Needing to make money, Le Prince set up his own interior design business, but it didn't go very well. But in 1887, when Le Prince's mother passed away, he found himself half-owning her five-story townhouse in Paris. The other half now belonged to his brother. Le Prince sold his half to his sibling, walking away with 60,000 francs, or about $700,000 in today's money. And then Le Prince's father-in-law stepped in, offering Le Prince the full use of his foundry back in Leeds. Le Prince said goodbye to his family in New York and returned to England. He could now focus on inventing the kind of camera he wanted to invent, one that would trick the eye into perceiving continuous motion. And he succeeded four years before Thomas Edison introduced his kinetoscope to the world. On January 10, 1888, Le Prince filed for an American patent for a 16-lens device that was both a motion picture camera and a projector, which he called the Stereopticon. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. (laughs) I only tripped over it a few times, (laughs) which you will edit out. He filed a near-identical patent in England. Right before submitting it, he added one sentence that promised a single-lens motion picture camera. But since he didn't include any diagrams or much description, the single-lens camera wasn't truly covered by the patents he received, which was a huge mistake. Le Prince carried his camera out to his father-in-law's garden in Leeds and shot that very first motion picture. As I said before, he filed and received his patents in the U.S. and Britain, and by 1890, Le Prince was scheduled to reveal his motion picture machine to the world. His trip to New York would be twofold. One, he could be reunited, if only temporarily, with his family, who he did miss dearly. And two, he could present his Le Prince single-lens Cine camera to the crowd at the Morris Jumel mansion. But before he left for the States, he decided to take a quick trip with some friends to go visit his brother in Dijon. For some unknown reason, Le Prince missed his train from Dijon back to Paris, and his friends headed back to the city without him. Le Prince did get on a later train bound for Paris. But then, he just completely disappeared. The French police, Scotland Yard, and the family searched extensively, but he was never found. The body pulled from the Seine, well, even though the corpse had the same mutton chops and extravagant mustache that Le Prince had, the corpse was deemed too short to be Louis Le Prince. Le Prince was officially declared dead in 1897, which meant, in accordance with Victorian-era law, that since Le Prince had been deemed missing, all of his intellectual property was in limbo for seven years until he could be declared officially dead. So, for those seven years, the Le Prince family was completely blocked from telling or showing the world what Louis had invented. To this day, no one knows what happened to Louis Le Prince, although, as I said, his wife, Lizzie, always believed that Thomas Edison had something to do with it. Now, it's just my opinion, but I can see Edison having something to do with it. There is some interesting stuff, which I'm going to get into. Like like this. Just eight months after her husband disappeared, 
The New York Sun ran an article about Edison's great new invention, the kinetograph, a motion picture camera based on a design Edison had patented just weeks after Le Prince disappeared. Then, that spring, while Lizzie was on a boat between New Jersey and Manhattan, she saw Edison himself on the same boat, in deep conversation with her husband's former patent officer, William Dameron Guthrie. That was more than enough for the grieving Lizzie to be certain that Thomas Edison had ordered her husband's disappearance. She was certain that Edison had hired someone to kidnap her husband. It was quite common for powerful inventors like Edison to write caveats, basically an action that prevented other inventors from working on something. Edison wrote hundreds of caveats for all different types of things, and with each one, he was granted access to the newly filed patent belonging to someone else and a whole year of free reign working with whatever the patent entailed. Yeah, he was a shrewd businessman. Yes. And he was a piece of shit. <laughs> well, how do you really feel? <laughs> so Lizzie's whole point was if if her husband's former patent dude was, you know, conversing with Edison on this boat. That there could was, be something to it. Right. It was more than likely that he had put in a caveat on the patent. And that's why eight months later, he released his version. Exactly. Yeah. In 1898, two years after Le Prince was officially declared dead rather than missing, his son, Adolf, was a witness for the American Mutoscope Company, who was in litigation against Edison at the time. The company was being sued by Edison for lost royalties. He claimed that because he invented the moving picture camera, the company owed him money. The company lost and had to pay up. It was Lizzie's hope that the trial would force Edison to reveal where Louis Le Prince had been taken to. Two years later, Adolf was found dead of a gunshot wound to the head on Fire Island. Since he was out duck hunting at the time, it was ruled a suicide. Seems kind of suspicious, but anyway, maybe it was. Just thought that was interesting. The Thomas Edison hired someone to kidnap Le Prince theory was never really substantiated, despite what Lizzie believed. And so, other theories were suggested. One was that Le Prince had somehow drowned in the Seine, which is why that one body was initially thought to possibly be his. Ultimately, as I had said, the body was deemed too short to be Le Prince, even though the resemblance to him was uncanny. Another theory was that Le Prince had chosen to disappear, either for financial reasons or personal ones. Some experts believe he actually made his way to Chicago, where he lived until 1898. Some speculated that Le Prince may have been gay, and his family forced him to start over in Chicago in relative obscurity. However, considering how much time and money his family put into finding him, that seems highly unlikely. Since there isn't really any more evidence for the disappearing by choice theory than any other theory, it isn't really substantiated either. According to the BBC.com, Le Prince's great great granddaughter, Lori Snyder, shared her own theory. She believes that Le Prince arrived in Paris around 11 p.m., and since his friends had gone on to England without him, he probably flagged down a hansom cab to take him to his workshop instead. It was late, and it makes sense that he would just spend the night somewhere familiar. 
Snyder speculates that since there was an issue with late night crime in Paris at that time, specifically targeting lone travelers, that the cab driver may have hit Le Prince over the head and then dropped his body into the Seine. In 1894, Thomas Edison received credit for inventing the first motion picture camera. Likewise, in France, the Lumiere brothers received credit for inventing the cinematograph device, which they demonstrated to the world in 1895. But even their device was an updated version of something that already existed, the cinematograph. Theirs was just a three-in-one version that could record, develop, and project motion pictures. So, essentially, all of the inventions related to motion pictures is one giant jumble of several inventors all racing to get there first. Lizzie Whitley figured some inventors were powerful enough and ambitious enough to kidnap their rivals in order to gain that top spot. Well, dear, that was interesting. I've never heard of Louis Le Prince before. A lot of people have not because he was basically forgotten for a good amount of time until people started looking into it and going, look, this guy did it first. And then he disappeared. <laughs> Isn't that suspicious? <laughs> well, there are a lot of good theories there. Mm -hmm. So who knows? Yeah, I mean, hopefully somebody will be able to dig enough I mean, there are books out there by people trying to solve the mystery. And so hopefully they'll keep digging until they can find something that's 100%. Yeah, and if they do, we'll do an update to the story. Yeah. And we'll be back after this short break. Hey, did you know... In 1992, administration at the Berga prison in Sweden came up with a brilliant alarm system. They deployed a gaggle of 20 geese to roam the prison property. The geese were excellent at honking and squawking in a large group at any prisoners who weren't where they were supposed to be. The prison administration made one bad decision, however— when they allowed the inmates to care for and feed the geese. The geese became attached to their caretakers and were happy to see them. They now only honked, squawked, and nipped at the actual guards. The goose attacks were so bad that officials decided to disband the web-footed patrol birds, corralling 16 of them into a coop to lay eggs and gifting four of them to the inmates as pets. Who'd have thunk it? All right, we're back. Yes, we are. And it's your turn. What are you going to tell us about? Well, my story is quite interesting. Well, of course it is. It has something to do with uh, a frog. Oh. But not the kind that you're going to put into any aquarium. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One night in 2016, a man named Sam Jacobs was playing Pokemon Go with his girlfriend behind the Congregation Beth Adam Synagogue on Loveland Madeira Road in Loveland, Ohio. Loveland is part of the greater Cincinnati area. As the couple crossed the train tracks to the banks of Lake Isabella, they spotted something remarkable. No, it wasn't an elusive Pokemon character. It was something far more elusive and stranger. As reported to WLWT, the NBC affiliate in Cincinnati, Jacobs described it as a four-foot-tall frog. Now, he said tall because the creature stood up on its hind legs and walked on two feet. Jacobs shot some video footage, which he happily gave to the TV station and which you can watch on YouTube if you'd like. And I'll have Beth put it in the show notes for you. He definitely caught something on camera, but... Other than two shining eyes, it's pretty impossible to tell exactly what it is. But that didn't dissuade Jacobs from claiming that the Loveland Frogmen had resurfaced. It had been a good 61 years since the original sighting in 1955, but the Loveland Frogmen has to be up there on the list of wacky cryptids. 
It was May of 1955, and as an unnamed traveling salesman drove through Loveland and crossed the Little Miami River by the way of a poorly lit bridge, he skidded to a stop. Three incredible creatures stood at the side of the road, their grotesque bodies casting eerie shadows. According to theportalist.com, each creature was about four feet tall and humanoid in shape, except they weren't wearing any clothes. Their skin was leathery in nature, and all three had webbed feet, webbed hands, and distinct frog-like faces. Their eyes seemed to bulge out of their eye sockets. Their hairless skulls were lined deep with ridges, and their mouths were wide and flat. At first, the frog people family didn't even seem to notice the motorists. They were too deep in some sort of conversation. But eventually, one did, and it pulled out some sort of stick from nowhere. It held it up and waved it around. Sparks even flew out of the end that was pointed towards the car, as if it were some sort of magic wand. Terrified, the man hit the gas and peeled off, only to have the overwhelming smell of almonds and alfalfa fill his car. Now, both almonds and alfalfa do grow in Ohio, so the smells might not have been all that unusual. But why the man smelled it then and only then is a mystery as well as why four-foot-tall frogs were waving magic wands around. The Loveland Frogman might have just been some crazy tale. I mean, after all, it was some unnamed traveling salesman with little evidence other than hearsay. It may have gone down in Ohio folklore as just that, lore. Except in 1972, the Frogman was spotted once again. According to the blog Haint Blue, it was March 3rd, 1972, when police officer Ray Shockey was driving parallel to the Little Miami River on Riverside Drive. It was around 1 a.m., and as Officer Shockey approached the Totes Boot Factory, he thought he spotted a stray dog in a field, but then it ran out in front of his car. Shockey said that the animal was about four feet tall and weighed between 50 and 70 pounds. It appeared leathery and had the face of a frog. As it ran across the road on two feet, it appeared hunched over until it got to the guardrail. It then stopped, stood up straight, and climbed right over. Shockey returned to the police station and asked fellow officer Mark Matthews to go back to the spot to look for evidence. The creatures were long gone by then, but both officers noted strange claw marks, like drag marks, on the side of the embankment. Just two weeks later, on March 17th, Officer Matthews was driving on Kemper Road near the Totes Boot Factory when he had his own sighting. He saw what he thought was roadkill in the center of the road. He pulled over with the intention of getting out and moving the animal to the side of the road, out of the motorist's way. But... As he opened his car door, the roadkill actually jumped to its feet and then crouched down like a linebacker. As Officer Matthews watched, the frogman walked unsteadily to the guardrail and then tried to pass underneath it. Knowing that he had never seen a creature like this before and that people were unlikely to believe him without some sort of proof, and since it sounds like the frogman was already injured, Matthews shot it. He picked it up, put it in his trunk, and went off to find Officer Shockey. When Matthews showed the now-dead frogman to him, Shockey confirmed that it was the exact same creature he had seen. Over the years, several other people have claimed to have seen the Loveland frogman. Generally, they report a four-foot-tall bipedal creature with webbed hands and feet and a face of a frog. They also report bright white eye shine and leathery skin. Now, you know that I like to do my due diligence, and I do try to find other explanations for things, so I looked up frogs. Now, what I did find is that there is a species of frog called the Goliath frog, or giant slippery frog, that can grow up to 12 inches long and weigh up to 7 pounds. Now, from all my encounters with frogs, that seems to be a pretty big frog. 
And from the online pictures, they're quite the beefy animal, but nowhere near as big as our four foot 60 pounder that the witnesses said that they saw. And Goliath frogs? They are native to Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea, so they aren't exactly local to Ohio. Now, there is the possibility that it was someone's pet, but it still doesn't measure up to what witnesses reported. And Goliath frogs certainly don't walk on two legs. For over 40 years, the two Loveland police officers stuck by their story, even as others embellished their accounts and added details that just weren't true, especially when the Internet got a hold of it. Interestingly enough, it wasn't until the 2016 sighting that Matthew supposedly came forward and changed his story. He contacted WCPO, the ABC affiliate TV station out of Cincinnati, and told them that he and Shockey had actually determined all those years ago that the Loveland Frogman was simply a tailless iguana. It was pretty cold that March, and if someone had let their pet go, it's possible that it was hiding out in the boot factory to stay warm. So, let's look at this iguana theory a little bit closer. There are two types of iguana that can run on two legs, the collared lizards of southwestern United States and Mexico. They do tend to have more of a frog-like head than your typical lizard, but they don't have webbed feet and they typically don't grow any longer than 15 inches at the most, including their tails. So, if the Loveland Frogman was simply a tailless iguana, it was an abnormally large one. One might even say supernaturally large. But that doesn't explain the 1955 sighting or the 2016 sighting. As you can imagine, some people wondered why Matthews waited 40 plus years to change his story especially since people have been embellishing it and retelling it for the last four decades. And does the iguana explanation really settle it? There are quite a few people out there who don't think so, but maybe that's just because they don't want to make the frogman with the sparkly magic wand angry. And speaking of angry, if we travel to South Carolina, there is an even bigger lizard to contend with, and he's definitely way angrier than the Frogman. Known as Lizard Man, this cryptid is even more elusive than his smaller froggy cousin. Lizard Man's story begins on June 29, 1988, in the small town of Bishopville. With a population of over just 3,000 people, Bishopville has some real charm with their historic opera house and the Pearl Friars Topiary Garden. But in the summer of 1988, things got a little weird. At around 2 a.m. on this summer night, 17-year-old Chris Davis was driving home from his shift at McDonald's. As he approached Scape Ore Swamp, one of his tires blew out. Scape Ore Swamp is a 154-square-mile basin created by a southeast-flowing tributary of the P.D. River. Now, the area that we're talking about is mostly made up of gently sloping hills. Now remember, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and Davis was alone in the area as he got out to change his tire. He had just finished up and was about to get in his car when he heard the sound of running feet quickly approaching him. According to roadtrippers.com, Davis said, quote, I looked back and saw something running across the field towards me. It was about 25 yards away, and I saw red glowing eyes. I ran into the car, and as I locked it, the thing grabbed the door handle. I could see him from the neck down, the three big fingers, long black nails, and green rough skin. It was strong, and it was angry. I looked in my mirror and saw a blur of green running. I could see his toes, and then he jumped off the roof of my car. I thought I heard a grunt and then I could see his fingers through the front windshield, where they curled around the roof. I sped up and swerved to shake the creature off, end quote. Davis claimed that the creature was seven feet tall and had scaly green skin. It had just three fingers on each hand 
which ended in black claws. Its eyes glowed red. It was a lizard man. When he got home, Davis took a good look at his car. The side mirror was badly damaged, and there were long scratch marks on the roof. Davis reported the incident to the local police and offered to take a polygraph test, which he did pass. Two weeks later, police were called out to investigate a car that was parked not far from Skateboard Swamp. Initially reported as vandalism, it turned out to have some odd damage. According to DiscoverSouthCarolina.com, first, the fenders had been ripped off, the antenna was bent, and there were deep scratches along the body. And even more strange, it appeared as though portions of the chrome had literally been chewed off. Now, perhaps it was a bear, except people within a three-mile radius of Scape or Swamp began calling in with their own sightings of a seven-foot-tall lizard man. They had seen it lurking in the swamp and in the woods. They had seen it running across the local airstrip also. All these witnesses were considered reliable by the police, and the damage to the cars were quite similar. Ripped and chewed fenders, scratch marks, and now bite marks. And in at least one case, the creature left tracks in the mud. Obviously concerned, the police made plaster cast of these footprints, which were obviously not from a bear. These tracks were quite strange. They were 14 inches long with a pronounced heel pad and three long toes. You can look at them online, and in all honesty, they don't look real to me. But the police took them seriously enough to at least consider sending them off to the FBI. But for some reason, they didn't end up sending them. But the conclusion was that they didn't match any known animal tracks. But the sightings and damaged cars continued on. By August, the story hit nationwide papers like the Washington Post, which ran an article under the headline, Lizard Man Claims a Casualty. The Sunday Times ran an article headlined, Sightings of a Monster Lizard from the Swamp Has Struck Terror into a Small Community in South Carolina. The TV show Good Morning America even did a segment live from the swamp. The radio station WCOS out of Columbia, South Carolina, even offered up a million dollars to anyone who could capture the lizard man alive. The last alleged sighting occurred on August 5, 1988. An airman stationed at Shaw Air Force Base named Kenneth Orr filed a police report stating that he had spotted the lizard man on Highway 15. He presented the police with what looked like several green scales in a small amount of blood since Orr claimed that he had shot and wounded the creature. Unfortunately, this sighting turned out to be a hoax. When Orr was arraigned for carrying a pistol without a permit just two days after he made his police report, he recanted his story and said that he was only trying to keep the public interest in the lizard man alive. After the news came out that this last sighting was a lie, people began speculating that Chris Davis's polygraph test was also part of a town-devised ploy to keep interest in the lizard man going. After all, it was bringing revenue to tiny Bishopville. Although it's easy to say that the footprints look fake and that some people were making stuff up, it doesn't mean that everyone was making it up, especially Chris Davis, who had absolutely no reason to lie in the first place. Well... My mind goes to if he was a 17 year old kid and he was on his way home from his job and, you know, maybe he accidentally damaged the car and then he didn't want to get into trouble at home. Maybe he would make up a story like that. But if he really did take an official polygraph test and he passed it, that does give credibility to his story, because if he'd made it up, you'd think it would have shown up in the polygraph test. Right. I yeah. mean, yes, you would think that, unless he knew how to deceive a polygraph test. A 17-year-old kid in 1988? Well, you never know. Yeah. I, I mean, don't know. Anything's possible. I do think that... I mean, that is a good theory. He may have 
done something stupid and, you know, trying to cover his tracks. You can see where a 17 year old would make up a story like that. Right. But I tend to think with a lot of these stories that people actually do see some strange shit. Well, yeah. <laughs> and I then mean... everybody else starts to see it, too. And those additional sightings may not always be accurate. Right. But I think it starts from truth. It starts from somewhere. Yes. You know. It always seems to have a little bit of truth to it. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's hard enough if you do see something telling somebody about it because you don't want to be laughed at. Right. Which is why you and I were perfect for each other because early on in our relationship, like second date, we were telling each other weird stuff that we had experienced and neither one of us laughed at each other. No. I mean, I've seen some, some strange things. But, you know, it's not something you go out and tell your coworkers about. Right. Because next thing you know, they're judging you a little bit. Right. And it may affect your job somewhat also. Right. But like I've said before, I mean, I'm not here to judge anybody. People see stuff all the time. I can't say that they have or haven't. Right. And I don't want to speculate on that, really. I mean, that's not my, it's not for me to do that. It's not our job. It's our because job just to share the stories that we find fascinating, right? Exactly. Yeah. And could there be a lizard man out there? Why not? Well, if there's a frog man, there's got to be a lizard man. Yeah, I don't know which I'd rather come across. The lizard man or the frog man? I mean, the frog man's pretty damn cool. I know. And... Plus, you know, they have that magic wand. I know. <laughs> That's the best part. <laughs> now, with all that said, the Lizard Man sightings stopped later that summer of 1988. But the legend of the Lizard Man has lived on. As well it should. It should. And it's so cool because it's... I mean, you're going on road trips, say, with your kids, and you want to keep them active and everything. And it's like, hey, keep an eye out for the Loveland Frogman. Right. Or the Lizard Man. Wouldn't that be the best road trip ever to do, like, a, a cryptid-themed road trip or to do a, a haunted-themed road trip and, like, just hit all the places that have had all these different sightings? I mean, it would take a while. <laughs> yeah, I the the haunted places yes that that would be cool but i think the cryptid idea of a road trip would be excellent that'd be fun we'd be seeing a lot of lakes because it's one thing to watch you know on tv these people going out and doing their thing looking for the cryptids but it'd be so cool to go do it on your own yeah and cross the country doing it yeah well you could even just hit all of the cryptid festivals like do one summer into fall and travel around the country and hit all the all the different ones, like the Champy Festival and the Mothman Festival. Well, or, we'll be at know? the Whitehall, New York Sasquatch Festival again this year. We will. They have a calling contest. They have all kinds of guest speakers. Um, they have cast there. I mean, it's... And they have some excellent vendors selling all kinds of cool things, not just Sasquatch-related. No, they have all kinds of different, uh, there was one place that had really cool stickers of cryptids from all over the country, and some people have uh, wall hangings and things that they've made that have nothing to do with Sasquatch. Really cool stuff. Yeah, and there was some excellent food there, and there were a lot of good food trucks. Mm -hmm. It was just an all-around great time. And it's going to be fun to be there again this year, because we got so many stories of people coming up to our, our booth and just sharing their personal stories with us. I mean, from all over the world. Yeah, there were people from England that came and talked to us. And yeah, that was pretty neat. And I felt like, honestly, I felt truly honored that people were trusting in us enough or, you know, just willing to just share their stories without us even really having to ask. It was pretty cool. Yeah. And the amount of kids that were there, I mean, young kids that, were truly interested in the topics and, you know, kind of suggested, hey, 
you might want to check this out. Mm -hmm. I was pretty I was pretty blown away by that. Yeah. Well, I guess that about wraps it up for this episode, Beth. Yes, and as always, if you would like to know more, you can check our sources in our show notes for more information. I always say there's a ton more and there always is. So if you are interested and want to keep reading and learning, that's a good place to start. Yeah, it's a good jumping off point to get started. Well, once again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you all next week on an all new episode of Where Our Minds Wander. See you soon. Thank you.